Warrior specializes in one thing, knocking stuff over. Dealing damage is a side effect of knocking stuff over. I'm going to explain how you should consider building Warrior as well as how to optimize your gameplay. The way of the bonk is a commonly misunderstood path, so please sit back and maybe have a notebook with you if you like doing that sort of thing. This is a Chad's Guide to Warrior. These are the sections this guide will cover. If you're a new Dragon's Dogma player, you may find watching this guide in one go a little overwhelming. The sections highlighted in green are beginner friendly. Make sure you understand these sections first, then move on to the sections highlighted in red once you're ready, since these cover more advanced mechanics. If you've caused to cross monsters, it's steel and muscle will see you through. Warrior is an advanced red vocation that can use two different weapons, long swords and war hammers. They can also equip up to three skills at once, and their kit is built strongly around staggering and knocking down enemies. Warhammers have higher stagger and knockdown than longswords, but generally look uglier. This is absolutely detrimental to the vocation, because playing warrior is all about confidence, and you're not going to have any when your weapon looks like rejected Monster Hunter concept art. Warrior's core skills consist of a basic light attack chain, a delayed light attack chain, a single heavy attack input, and a hold heavy attack input. The basic light attack chain, which only requires hitting the light attack button three times in a row, is short and good for attacking a single target. The delayed light attack chain called Devastate, which is triggered by hitting light attack once, waiting for the animation to end, then pressing light attack three more times after that, lasts a very long time and can leave you vulnerable, but provides you with wide sweeping swings that can easily hit multiple enemies. Your heavy attack isn't very good, but when you unlock the hold heavy attack input, Eviscerate, it gives you a quick source of stagger that can be useful on smaller enemies. When a warrior is knocked back or knocked down, they can press the jump button when they hit the ground to activate controlled fall, rolling into the fall and getting back up faster. You're better off spamming jump whenever you go flying to basically guarantee you'll hit the input on time. Warrior also has a hidden passive that makes them immune to stagger while in the middle of an attack. Unfortunately, more powerful enemy attacks can break through the super armor, but this will still help avoid getting stun locked when surrounded by multiple enemies. Finally, Warrior can grab the hold button on a small to medium sized enemy to grapple them. A grappled foe takes 2.33 times more damage and keeps them still for a few moments, which your allies can take advantage of. You can kick them too. When creating your character, your weight and height will have a rather major impact on your gameplay. The heavier your character, the higher your carry weight and stamina will be, but you'll also move slower. The weight and height you decide on is more or less up to personal preference, but having a larger character does make it easier to carry around the heavy armor and weapons that Warrior uses. The larger stamina pool that comes with playing as a heavy character also helps when using Iracles. That being said, the default male preset is more than enough carry weight and stamina for warriors, without compromising too heavily on movement speed. You may find playing as a taller character makes it easier to hit jump light attacks when an enemy is higher up in the air. Aside from blunt and slashing damage and differing stagger and knockdown values, warhammers and longswords have the same skills and animations. Certain enemies like skeletons are weak to blunt damage, so warhammers are better, and some are weaker to slashing like hydras in which a longsword is more appropriate. Now why is stagger and knockdown so important? First, we'll briefly explain how it works. Each enemy has its own stagger and knockdown threshold. Each attack has its own stagger and knockdown value assigned to it. These attacks help in causing an enemy to reach their stagger or knockdown threshold. When an enemy's stagger threshold has been reached, they will stagger. When their knockdown threshold has been reached, they will be knocked over. Now stagger interrupts an enemy's animation while Knockdown puts them in a vulnerable state that gives you and your party a nice, safe damage window. Along with this, most enemies in the game take two times more damage when they are knocked down. Warrior is serviceable while playing solo, but excels in a party, as it can easily knock down enemies for your team, giving you all a safe damage window as well as a hefty damage boost on top of that. Do note that on hard mode, enemies have three times stagger and knockdown resistances, which is why I'll go over some equipment that'll help mitigate this issue next. Take up arms, Arisen, for my kind do not heed the toothless. 
Warhammers are valuable for their higher stagger and knockdown values, but there are other notable equipment pieces you can use. The most important jewelry for Warrior, and almost every vocation in the game, are the barbed nails. You can equip two at once, and they provide 100 stagger and knockdown power each. Madeline sells them if you've advanced her quest far enough, or you can find them in the following chests. Get these as soon as possible, they will change your life. When starting out your playthrough, you can go to BBI immediately and try to hoard the high level equipment there. If you want to avoid doing that, then visiting the Blue Moon Tower early will let you get some valuable armors, such as the Griffic Armor or Assailant's Braces. If you do go there, make sure you have a poor crystal to place down so you never have to walk there again. Soulflare Canyon also has some valuable drops, though they're more RNG dependent than Blue Moon Tower. Make sure to give the Gold Idol to Caxton for some decent base game armors, like Chimeric, as you progress further through the main quest. An incredibly valuable early game longsword is Griffic Victory, which you can get by completing Sir Burn's escort quest available at the Grand Soren Inn notice board. After slaying Grigori, you'll get a nice upgrade for your longsword, both in terms of stats and drip factor. If you find yourself with a rusted greatsword or warhammer, keep it so you can dragonforge it. When a rusted weapon is upgraded to at least 3 star enhancement, it gains the ability to apply torpor on enemies when it hits them. Torpor is a debilitation that slows a target's movement speed by 50%. Each upgrade beyond 3 star makes rusted weapons apply torpor with fewer hits. This debilitation is great crowd control, especially with Warrior's slower animations. Do note that enemies will still deal the same amount of damage even while afflicted with Torpor. You can also give a rusted weapon to your pawn so they can apply this debilitation for you, or use a rusted longsword or warhammer to do it yourself. It's recommended that upon inflicting Torpor, you swap to a proper DPS weapon to deal damage, and then swap back to Rusted once the debilitation wears off. Then you apply Torpor again, swap back to your DPS weapon, and keep doing that over and over again. Upon completing the main quest on hard mode, you'll be rewarded with a set of Duke's clothing. This armor has a weirdly high stagger and knockdown resistance. For your cloak, your options are more flexible. Prioritize a cloak that gives resistances to a debilitation you're lacking in. Sleep resistance is very useful for the entirety of the game, so Mahogany Cape and Harpy's Cloaks are good options. Make sure to get the Tattered Mantle from the Tainted Mountain and Dragonforge it. It starts off with very poor resistances, but becomes a very well-rounded cloak once fully upgraded. From the Black Cat, you have quite a few options. Iracles can be purchased early into a playthrough, but some may find it a bit uncomfortable to play at a lower level. I'll go into more detail regarding this sword at the end of the video. Our other options consist of Dragon's Flight, which deals bonus damage against dragons. If the Devilfire Grove Drake is giving you a hard time, give him a concussion instead. Then there's Cyclops Bane, which contrary to its name, also deals bonus damage against ogres, not just cyclopes. These two weapons are good early game carries against some powerful foes you may struggle with at this point in the game. Finally, there's the Stamina Hammer, which permanently increases the aggro of the wielder when equipped. You can give this weapon to your pawn and turn them into a tank. It also makes all the skills that the wielder uses cost zero stamina. This weapon is incredibly good at drawing aggro, but if your pawn is low investment, they may die a lot. The damage is also incredibly low, so it serves little use outside of drawing aggro. If you've the need and the coin, I've the wares. The Immortal's armor set doesn't require getting relentlessly pegged by RNG to obtain, as you just have to do these notice board quests. The best heavy armor in the game is Hellfire, which is acquired through cursed level 3 armor drops. The best warhammer in the game is Devil's Nail while Bitter End is the best longsword. Bitter End also has an effect that deals 20% more damage when your health is in the red, along with a healthy dose of tinnitus. Then there's the Cursed King's Bell, which provides 50 stagger power, and the Persecutor slash Tormentor's Masks, which give 50 knockdown. Pair these two armors with two barbed nails, the Impact Augment, and a powerful Warhammer like Devil's Nail to slam dunk enemies regardless of game difficulty. The Cursed King's Bell can be acquired very early in a playthrough if you go to Bitter Black Isle as soon as physically possible. As soon as you arrive, interact with the notice board and accept the quests. After you finish at least one of these quests, which trust me, will be very easy, you will be able to accept the quest Visions of the End 1. This quest asks you to acquire 10 macabre sculptures. Upon doing so, you will be rewarded with the Cursed King's Belt. If you wish to know where to find 10 of these easily, don't ask me. Just look it up, you lazy piece of shit. Make sure the 10 macabre sculptures are in your inventory, not your storage, in order to complete the quest. The Persecutor and Tormentor's masks are harder, as they're a rare drop from Illuminators. 
The Tormentor's Mask can be acquired from level 2 armor purifications. Out of the two, Persecutor is better because it provides sleep resistance, but the knockdown bonuses are the same. When purifying these cursed items, make sure both you and your pawn are pure red vocations, such as Fighter or Warrior. This means you will only get roles relevant to the red classes, though it can still be difficult to get what you want. This is because the Red Vocation Weapon Level 3 Purification Pool has six different weapons you could get, while yellow classes have four and blue classes only have two. Never purify cursed items as a hybrid vocation, such as Mystic Knight, Magic Archer, or Assassin, because then you'll be receiving roles from two separate vocation pools instead of just one. When purifying level 3 armors, you have a chance of receiving a bonus effect or enchantment. You can see this bonus in the description at the bottom of the flavor text. These are the bonuses you should keep an eye out for as they are optimal for Warrior. Increases strength when noticed by multiple enemies. Gradually restores health. Restores stamina on kill and increases carry weight or prevents wind from affecting mobility. Make sure the wording is exactly the same as the images here, because some of these effects only slightly boost your stats. You're looking out for the enchantments that don't have the word slightly in them. When purifying, keep an eye out for the warrior's ring. It can be acquired from cursed level 3 gears, as well as level 2. The skills you want it to roll are Arc of Obliteration and Calamitous Lunge. Calamitous Lash is glitched, and will sometimes do little to no damage. It's very inconsistent, so you should stick to a Dominable Lash, the second tier version. Ecliptic Slash is another good one, but I honestly believe Calamitous Lunge and Arc of Obliteration will serve you better. These two skills are insanely powerful. Obliteration helps with more consistent and devastating knockdowns, while Calamitous Lunge, when paired with Eracles, is a match made in heaven that puts any ship you may find on AO3 to shame. I'll talk about these in more detail in the Skill and Eracles sections of this guide. For cloaks, the advice is the same for the early game section. Use whichever cloak helps round out your debilitation resistances. If you don't need any more debilitation resistances, consider getting the Nebula Cape from the Everfall. This underrated cape has the highest elemental resistances out of any cloak in the game. And now again, the choice is yours, Arisen. In Dragon's Dogma, your base stats are determined by the vocation you were playing as when you leveled up. Each vocation has its own unique stat growths that it gains per level. Assassin gets the most strength out of everyone when it levels up, so if you want to max out your strength base stats, level up Assassin as much as possible. Here's a table with all the vocations and their stat growths. Now, caring about your base stats is very min-maxy. I love min-maxing my base stats, but most people don't, and if you don't want to bother with this stuff, then don't worry about it. Equipment and augments make up a majority of your power, while base stats just add a little extra oomph to your build. Min-maxing base stats is not essential, and it's up to you to decide if it's something you want to do. Anyway, my fellow min-maxers, here are some good level paths for warrior. I like running 1 to 10 fighter and 11 to 200 assassin for my warrior builds. This gives you the highest possible strength in the game, as well as a lot of stamina. The only downside is that your defenses will be low. If this sounds unappealing to you, then playing 1 to 10 fighter and 11 to 200 warrior is perfectly viable. You won't have as much strength, but still a good amount of it. Your stamina will be on the lower side, but you'll still have a lot of health and defenses. You may want the best of both worlds and have both assassin and warrior present in your level path. If you level 1 to 10 fighter, 11 to 100 warrior, then 101 to 200 assassin, you will receive the following base stats. But if you swap it around, fighter 1 to 10, assassin 11 to 100, and warrior 101 to 200, you will actually have different base stats, despite having the same amount of levels in both vocations. This is because the player character receives more stats per level until they reach level 100. After level 100, the stats you earn upon leveling up will decrease beyond that. This means if you want more of Warrior's tankiness, level up as it before level 100. But if you want Assassin's higher stamina growth, level it while you're below level 100. There's very little need to overcomplicate your builds any further than this, even from a meta standpoint but you can use the Dragon's Dogma stat planner to come up with your own builds. Honestly, you will have good enough base stats if you just level up as a physical focused vocation. Whether your level path has 50 levels in Assassin, 20 in Ranger, 30 in Fighter, 40 in Warrior, you'll have plenty of the base stats you need. Of course, a max Assassin build is optimal for Warrior, because the lack of defense can be made up purely with skill. But Dragon's Dogma as a video game doesn't demand such levels of optimization. They are something the player themselves can choose to strive for if they wish, to become as powerful as physically possible. 
but as I said, this isn't necessary. The game doesn't require this of you. Hell, even if you leveled entirely as Sorcerer, your damage would be fine. Would it be optimal? No. Can you still clear all the content in the game relatively easily with good augments and equipment? Yes. Regardless, I hope you found the information you were looking for in this section. Let's move on to augments. Take up your tiny bobs of steel and fight. Warrior possesses some of the best augments in the game. Clout is essential for its 20% strength bonus. Impact gives you a knockdown bonus, which needless to say is also essential. Bastion is highly valuable during early game hard mode, but loses relevancy later on. Proficiency is quite good, especially when using Iracles. Ferocity is okay, but you can just slot a strength boosting augment instead. Temerity and Audacity are useful, but I personally believe there are better options. Warrior benefits greatly from Fighter Augments and a little bit of Strider too. You can also get Autonomy from Rank 9 Assassin if you wish to play solo. With Fighter, Vehemence at Rank 8 is essential with its 10% Strength buff. Egression at Rank 5 makes it easier to wriggle out of grabs, which is a nice quality of life passive if you need it. Along with quality of life, there is Sanu at Rank 5 to boost your carrying capacity. From Strider, the only augment you really need to care about is Imminence at Rank 5, which boosts your strength by 30% while jumping. Warriors tend to use jump attacks frequently, making this quite valuable. Opportunism and Adhesion are augments that can be acquired from Purifying Curse to level 3 novelties. You can purify them as any vocation, by the way. Opportunism increases your strength by 30% while climbing, while Adhesion stops you from getting swung around and staggered while climbing an enemy. Prioritize Adhesion, because while a damage boost sounds more valuable, actually being able to hit an enemy while climbing it is far more important. What's the point of a damage boost if the enemy won't stop moving around and you can't hit it anyway? This is the augment combination I personally use almost all the time when playing Warrior. An incredibly powerful combo for every vocation in the game is Sanctuary with Exhilaration and slash or Equanimity. Sanctuary maxes out your physical defense while your health is in the red, making you practically immune to physical attacks. You still take normal damage from magic, so be careful of that. Exhilaration boosts your strength by 35% while your health is in the red, allowing it to synergize with Sanctuary. If you're playing on the Dark Arisen version, make sure your strength boosting augments don't exceed 80%, as your damage won't increase further beyond that. If you decide you want to use this setup, try out these augment combinations. I personally don't use this setup because it's too powerful. Weapons, armor, skills, there are endless combinations to try out. Since you can only equip three skills at a time, it's important to consider what the most important ones to bring along are. Exodus Slash gives you iframes, so it's basically your dodge button. I'll explain some more advanced tech you can use with it later. Equip this skill and Warrior will feel a trillion times more comfortable. Hombobash is a guard break. It's useful against ogres when they do their blocking bullshit. It's also an insanely fast skill, so you can use it to quickly stagger smaller enemies that are about to run away. It weaves quite seamlessly into basic attack combos too. Arc of Deliverance is a big knockdown attack that can be upgraded into Arc of Obliteration with the Warrior's Ring, assuming it rolled Obliteration. Arc has insane knockdown. With the Obliteration upgrade, it can kill some enemies with gravity. That's how much knockdown it has. Or, or knock up. I guess it's knock up if they're going up in the air. Indomitable Lash is a little baby arc of deliverance, but along with having a shorter wind up time, you have to release it at the perfect time to deal the most damage with it. Perfect timing is releasing it as soon as the skill finishes charging. Your character will flash to symbolize this, or you can just look at the skill bar. It's literally a melee version of Ranger's Deathly Arrow. The Calamitous Lash upgrade from the Warrior's Ring is bugged, and sometimes it deals barely any damage, so just stick with Indomitable. Whirlwind Slash is a decent skill, but too situational. The knockdown is really only noticeable on small targets. Corona Slash and its circular swing requires less precise positioning, but admittedly, Whirlwind deals more damage. Even if Warrior could equip 6 skills, I don't think I'd use it. It's still a good skill, but there are better options out there. Catapult Blade launches an ally into the air. You can either use it yourself to launch a pawn, or have your pawn launch you instead. It's highly situational, and unfortunately, pawns don't tend to use airtime very well, even if they're a strider. Dragon's Dogma pawns have the capacity to play at a high level of intelligence, but their AI doesn't work well with this skill, except against specific enemies like griffins.
Active Vengeance has three levels that are increased as you take damage while charging it. The first level is after 400 damage, second after 800, and the final level after 1200. Upon release, you will do four times the damage you absorbed. Generally, the skill is pretty bad. While charging, you have heightened resistances to knockdown and some debilitations, but not enough. I've worn equipment that gives me over 100% staggering knockdown immunity and still get staggered while charging it. Active Vengeance can be used to great effect in very specific scenarios that require setup. Gamma V did a video in which they one-shot death using this skill. I will talk about this setup in greater detail during the death section of this guide. Warcry is a skill that draws aggro. The Stamina Hammer draws aggro more consistently, but if you want your Warrior Pawn to still do damage, use this skill instead and give them a normal weapon. Corona Slash is a low, circular sweep that can knock small foes down easily in an area. The skill is fun and has absolute god tier hitbox pawn. If you're skilled enough, you can use it to duck attacks intentionally. I love it, but unfortunately there are more valuable skills, so it's up to you if it's worth slotting. The AoE is good, and so is the knockdown, but it has very little use against big targets. Finally, Indomitable Lunge is a charging, multi-hit attack. This skill is good on its own, but when used alongside Ericles, it's absolutely insane. I'll have a whole section dedicated to Ericles where I'll talk about this skill further. Now we're on to gameplay. Tis not defeat to flee from battle, Master. Tis survival. In case you haven't gotten the gist of it yet, try to knock things down as much as possible. You can do this with Arc of Deliverance slash Obliteration, or by hitting an enemy enough until they keel over. Jump Light Attacks are a valuable part of Warrior's kit, especially when paired with Imminence. You are generally more mobile and attack faster, but make sure to keep an eye on your surroundings. If an enemy goes to attack you and you're in midair, you can't do anything to stop them. Also, jump light attacks can be used to extend your vertical height slightly and horizontal distance greatly. This means you can cover gaps otherwise impossible without double jump, or save time during combat. For example, I want to get around this dragon so I can attack its heart. Running around takes too long. Instead, I can just do a light jump attack here, and it will vault me over the dragon, giving me access to its heart. This may sound like overly niche advice, but it's honestly game-changing, especially as dragons become more common in the late game. Jump light attacks are great for gap closing, chasing enemies down, applying stagger and knockdown buildup, and overall DPS. Exodus slashes your dodge button, and it can avoid basically anything that isn't a grab, thanks to the fact that it's based around iframes. These iframes last a surprisingly long time too. Try to be creative and learn about all the different things you can dodge in this game with iframes. Spoiler, if it's not a grab, it can be iframed. It's simply a matter of whether the iframes outlast the duration of the attack. When an enemy is downed, you should attack its weak points with light jump attacks for the most damage, or calamitous lunge. Jump heavy attacks are generally worse unless you're using Ericles. The animation is longer and so is the end lag. The damage generally isn't as good as just jump light attacks, but it is useful for when you need to strike downwards specifically like if a small enemy is knocked over, or you're attacking from above. Warrior's gameplay loop consists of knocking down, damaging, then knocking down again. What I talked about earlier will help with that, but it's time I explain some more advanced mechanics to optimize your warrior gameplay. Me, I've no love of magic and its kind. Iron and steel hold to an edge. That's all a man really needs. The first thing we need to talk about is something called Stagger and Knockdown Vulnerability Windows, which is a term I just made up to describe a mechanic that exists in-game. An SKDVW is a period of time in which an enemy is more susceptible to Stagger and Knockdown damage. This is usually after performing a specific action. You should learn to predict when these will occur so you can use your high knockdown attacks during these moments. For example, when a Chimera lunges, they are vulnerable to stagger and knockdown damage as soon as they land, and for a few seconds after. Do note that there is a difference between a Chimera jumping normally to cover distance and actually pouncing with the intent of attacking you. Only during the latter are they more vulnerable to stagger and knockdown. You can counter this with an Exodus Slash to dodge their initial lunge followed by another attack input to trigger the second half of Exodus's animation. Chimeras experience another vulnerability window when they start freaking out and doing this thing. You can just smack them normally and they'll fall right over. Lots of you might be aware of this, but Eliminators have a very big window when doing their charge attacks. This means you can do stuff like this. Or you can even just jump light attack and make them comically flop to the ground. Cyclopes are vulnerable to stagger and knockdown when they are picking up objects from the ground or when they do this turnaround backswing. 
This includes the condemned gore Cyclops. I recommend sticking to the gore's right foot and charging an arc. As long as you're under him, it's very unlikely he'll hit you. It may take a bit to learn to predict when he'll swing around, but it's generally after doing this little stomp attack. As he turns, or maybe just a little bit before he starts turning, release your arc and he'll topple right over, assuming you didn't entirely smack his ankle armor. This works on little Cyclopes as well. While we're on the topic of Cyclopes, the Gore Cyclops can be disarmed quite easily with Warrior. When he does an overhead swing down, use Exodus Slash followed by the second input to trigger the pommel uppercut animation and disarm him. For regular Cyclopes, you can hit their hands with basically anything and they'll drop their cudgel. All forms of ogres are vulnerable after they do this charge attack and miss. You'll see them try to regain their balance here and you can either hit them with a big knockdown attack or simply just grapple onto them. They also take extra damage when getting up from a drop kick, similar to if they were knocked down. So make sure to exit a slash through these, then attack them. This is somewhat unrelated, but using a jewel of sleep to make an ogre pass out is incredibly effective. You can charge an arc of obliteration and generally one-shot them even with a mediocre weapon, thanks to the sleep damage multipliers. Garms are also highly vulnerable to sleep debilitations and having their skull caved in while unconscious. Pity on wingless human, return to the earth. I'll briefly explain how to deal with flying enemies. They're actually quite easy as warrior because your jump light attack has good reach and high knockdown for smacking them to the floor. When fighting harpies, you can either smack them as I said earlier, or wait for them to swoop you, perform exodus slash and the slash will generally knock them down. Now liches and whites are the only flying enemy in the game that you will actually need a ranged pawn to deal with. They lower to the ground very inconsistently and will almost always be out of reach. When fighting these enemies, sit back and let your pawns do all the work, or promptly end your life at the prospect of fighting the most poorly designed enemy in the game. The Dark Bishop is an exception, as he lowers to the ground when casting spells, and deserves a kiss on the lips because of this. Which shall you be, man, dragon, or aught else? Next up are dragons. Warriors have many ways to deal with this lot. If a dragon is on the ground, make sure to stick close to it as much as possible, using Exodus to avoid attacks. Keep an eye out for when it's about to start flying and climb it as soon as you see the animation start. You can then attack it until they fall down, which shouldn't take too long. If you are unable to grab it or the dragon was already flying, you can hit its tail instead until it falls down. But this can take a little bit of time, the fastest way is to time your jump attack to hit the wing, and this will almost always knock them down. Generally speaking, when a dragon flies, it could be considered one big stagger and knockdown vulnerability window. If you're struggling to hit the wing, you can use Indomitable Lash on its tail, or just use Arc of Obliteration underneath it. If you're struggling with dragons backing away from you while flying, wait for them to start their breath attacks. Once they release it, they will remain in that position in which you can walk around and smack them to the ground. Otherwise, try to back them into a wall so they can't move away from you. Keep an eye out for when a dragon flies up and smashes back into the ground. You can use Exodus Slash to dodge the initial wing flap, which would normally stagger you. Then use it again as it smashes into the ground. While you can use the Stability Augment or Hellfire Greaves with the right enchantment to avoid being staggered by wing flaps, it's also possible to iframe through these. Curse Dragons, Grigori, and the Ur Dragon have a massive nuke attack that they do at half health. You can choose to predict this and climb the dragon to attack its heart. Generally, you won't get hit, but sometimes the attack will ricochet off of walls and hit you. Consider not climbing the dragon when it's facing a wall, because then the breath attack will likely bounce back onto you. If you are able to climb the dragon, this is a very big damage window. Dragons in general are very weak to being climbed, but they do have maneuvers used to drain your stamina and stagger you if you're climbing onto them. With the Adhesion Augment, you can bypass the stagger, but keep an eye on your stamina, otherwise you'll fall off. Try to position your character below a dragon's heart if it's located on their chest. This way, their attacks won't hit you, but the hitbox for the heart is still within reach. Do be careful of spells though, if the dragon can cast spells like Grigori or the Ur Dragon. Holy magic will end its wicked existence! Ghosts are immune to physical damage, which poses quite a problem for Warrior and literally every other strength-focused vocation. Dragon's Dogma is built around team composition, so having pawns that make up for what the player character lacks is an expectation the game thrusts upon you, unless you're playing as Magic Archer Mystic Knight or Strider. As a Warrior, bring at least two Sorcerers. They can enchant your weapon so you can damage ghostly beings, or they'll just blast everything themselves. 
The benefit of having two sorcerers on your team is that they'll spell sync off each other, making it easier for them to cast. The other benefit to having pawns is when ghosts possess them, you are able to attack the ghost even with physical damage. Make sure to use a powerful single hit attack on your possessed pawn. You can only attack once per possession, so a weak attack is not worth using. Your pawn will conveniently stand in front of you, so you can ready something bigger to get the most damage in while you can. Throwing a barrel or exploding barrel at a wall also unlodges a ghost that possesses you. Warrior doesn't have to be dependent on pawns however. Purchase some coin purses of charity from Fornival and kill anything in the game with capitalism. This drawing item deals both physical and magic holy damage, so it's viable in basically every situation. If your Arisen gave all their money to Madeline, get yourself a permanently enchanted weapon instead. Malignance, an ice enchanted longsword, can be acquired after giving Caxton a gold or silver idol. Ardent Will, imbued with fire, can also be purchased from Caxton, but only if you gave him a gold idol. Dwells in Light is a beautiful holy longsword that can be acquired from killing the online Ur Dragon. Do note that this weapon is outclassed by basically anything in BBI, and the process of getting it is tediously painful. I would know. I have it. Boltbringer is the best enchanted longsword in the game, and can be acquired from purifying red, cursed level 2 weapons. For permanently enchanted warhammers, you have Fiery Talon from Caxton after giving him a gold and silver idol, and Rooted Gloom after giving him a gold idol. Angel's Fist from the Ur Dragon is objectively better stat-wise than Dwells in Light, aside from the fact that only bodybuilders can carry it. Like Dwells in Light, it is also not worth farming. I would know. I have it too. Twinterfang deals the same magic damage as Boltbringer, but has higher physical damage. With higher physical damage comes higher weight value apparently, because it's twice as fucking heavy as a Boltbringer. I am not carrying this around, fuck you, Aura. If you want to improve your magic weapon damage, bring Demon's Periaps with you, since they also boost the magic damage of your weapon. Living armors are also ghosts, but aren't capable of possession. When their armor is rent, they become immune to physical damage. Using Arc of Obliteration to send them in the air and letting full damage do the work is how Warrior can expect to contribute to a fight with Living Armors. Otherwise, you can keep aggro on the Living Armor with the Stamina Hammer, War Cry, or by attacking it a lot to keep its attention. Make it face the opposite way of your Sorcerer Pawns. With its back exposed to them, they'll have a very easy time nuking it. You may want to use a permanently enchanted weapon while fighting Living Armors as well. Here now, Warrior such as yourself seeks always finer weapons, yeah? I've been talking about Exodus Slash a lot, but there are a couple ways to use it. Some people never upgrade to Exodus Slash and keep it at the first tier, Escape Slash. This is because Escape Slash doesn't have a second attack animation, so you can just spam Escape over and over again without triggering the second animation. I've personally never cared for this and quite like the second attack of Exodus, so it's up to you. Let's break down Exodus Slash and talk about the most efficient way to use it. Exodus starts off with an initial low damage slash that gives iframes. If you press the skill again, you'll trigger the second attack animation while also removing your active iframes. The second attack has decent knockdown and can be used to assist in countering enemies, but this final slice down is fucking useless. It can look very cool if you use it to finish off an enemy, but that doesn't stop it from being objectively bad. It does barely any damage or stagger in knockdown, it's slow and can't be cancelled once it starts, and has a metric fuckton of end lag. This is problematic considering it removes your iframes. Here's what you should do instead. Press Exodus Slash once, press the skill a second time, and then jump as soon as the second animation ends. This will cancel the final slice down attack and lets you use a jump attack instead, which is far better. I've come to use this constantly, and you've probably been seeing me use it for the whole video. Cast a monster down below and it won't soon return. Arc, especially the obliteration version, has stupidly high stagger and knockdown. Along with using it to exploit stagger and knockdown vulnerability windows, it can send enemies high enough into the air that they take full damage. This depends on the enemy of course, but living armors, eliminators, and even death himself can be flung into the air. When dealing with living armors, you can attack with enchanted weapons such as Boltbringer or Twinterfang, but gravity damage via Arc of Obliteration is very potent. Make sure to stack as many stagger and knockdown boosting equipments and augments as possible to consistently pull this off. Warrior has an incredibly easy time dealing with Daemon. Despite not having access to the broken abilities and items that ranged vocations can use, the most efficient way to kill Daemon with Warrior is by climbing him. 
you should bring Mage's Periaps to help tank his Levins. Make sure you're at the top of his head for both forms, because it lets you jump over his immolations and land back on his head. Bring all the stagger and knockdown equipment you have, so you can stagger him as quickly and frequently as possible. When he does his vortex, just use liquid vim if you need to avoid the stamina drain, but otherwise stay on his head and don't let go. You'll stagger him and can wail on him without having to worry about taking damage. If your damage sucks, consider stacking 4 Conqueror's periaps. You can also do this when he does his vortex. It looks very cool, but it's more efficient to climb him for consistent DPS. Awakened Daemon is the exact same strategy. When he does his ghost arm attack, it won't hit you if you're on top of his head, so remain here as much as possible. It's recommended to wear the Cursed King's Belt, Persecutor's Mask, two barbed nails, and have the Impact Augment equipped while climbing Daemon, since they make it easier to stun lock him. You may feel inclined to swap some more of your augments around if Daemon still proves challenging. Adhesion and Opportunism will make quick work of him thanks to their climbing bonuses. Clout and Vehemence with their strength boosts will help in ending the fight faster. You can even slot Sanctuary to help survive his melee attacks, but it won't do anything for his magic. The Augment's Awareness and Apotropism will help you survive Daemon's spells. Autonomy will also help with reducing the damage you take from him and increase your attack power along with Bloodlust, but you may choose to bring Pawns along instead of using Autonomy, as they can add to your overall DPS and disperse his aggro. Remember that Periaps stack up to a maximum 4 times, so use Conqueror's Periaps for your strength damage, then 4 Angel and Major's Periaps to cover the defensive side of things. With this setup, Warrior can make quick work of Daemon. And of course, don't forget to bring some healing curatives just in case. Tis the end if its scythe finds you asleep. There are many ways to approach facing death. Make sure you possess sleep immunity before confronting him, whether it be through the debilitation resistances your gear gives you, or stocking up on sobering wine. If you want to damage him down normally, you're going to be there for a while. One of the fastest methods to killing death is by positioning him over an open cliff and using a knockdown skill to send him to the depths below, killing him. This method is relatively quick and should be used to farm XP efficiently. The biggest downside is that you miss out on his loot. The fastest way to kill death as a warrior is to use the active vengeance method. Gamma V made a video in which they one-shot death using this skill. I will leave that video in the description. Gamma V is a very skilled player, and I recommend checking out their stuff if you want to learn even more about Dragon's Dogma. For now, I will explain how this Act of Vengeance setup works. The Secret Augment Tenacity, which can be acquired from level 3 Cursed Novelties, has a high chance of leaving you at one health point if you take a fatal blow. The higher your health, the more likely you are to survive. If an enemy casts Exequy on you while you charge Act of Vengeance, and you use the Tenacity Augment to survive, the damage received from Exequy will be reflected back as you release the attack. This results in one-shotting death and numerous other enemies. Make sure there is an enemy around that can use Exequy while you're facing death. This will most likely be a Maneater or a Frostworm. Whatever it is, absorb the Exequy while charging Active Vengeance, and use the Tenacity Augment to avoid dying. Release it upon death and he will die. If this setup is too difficult, chasing him through Bitterback Isle and whittling down his health bar is your next best option. You can use 4 Conqueror's Periaps to boost your damage, and even bring some well-trained DPS pawns. You would rise against me once more. There's very little reason to fight the Ur-Dragon as a warrior, especially the online version, but contrary to popular belief, it's possible to kill it with warrior. You just have to hit the wings with the jump attack. It doesn't matter where you hit the wings, the hearts on them will still take damage. Everywhere else can be accessed by climbing. Warrior is capable of soloing the Ur-Dragon, but it's better off to bring some pawns just to help speed things up a bit. Just being at your side fills this pawn with vigor, Arisen. Warrior works great with pawns, especially sorcerers. I always run Warrior with two sorcerers and one strider. The sorcerers can spell sync off each other, while your strider can deal range damage. Striders are also highly competent in melee scenarios. Sorcerers are very valuable, since they can deal magic damage, something Warrior can't do on its own without an enchanted weapon. You and a main strider pawn should be more than enough to keep the aggro while your sorks cast. I recommend making your own sorcerer pawn, because then you only need to find one more. 
Most sorcerer pawns found online are awful, so making your own will help in maintaining your sanity. I have a document detailing my pawn builds and explaining some of the confusing stuff about how the AI works. I've linked it in the description, so if you need help building a good pawn, check it out. I'm sure you'll find all you need. Ericles is such a unique weapon that it single-handedly changes Warrior's core playstyle. First, I'll explain what this longsword does. The stats for this weapon are dreadful. That's because Ericles has an approximately 25% chance to do 9 times as much weapon damage. This bonus applies to the weapon's strength, your equipment bonuses, and even the enchantments applied to your sword. This means having Ericles enchanted with Holy by one of your pawns can be used to great effect against wraiths and other ghosts. Your character's base strength and the strength stat of the skill you use are not multiplied, however. Do note that Ericles has pitiful stagger and knockdown stats that don't receive any buffs. That's why this sword changes Warrior's core playstyle. This sword makes Warrior an actual DPS instead of focusing on stagger and knockdown. That's assuming you get lucky because the RNG sword will fuck you over sometimes. While Ericles is my favourite weapon in the entire game, it has some downsides that aren't related to being dependent on RNG. Simply equipping the weapon increases your stamina consumption by 50%. Warrior doesn't use an awful lot of stamina compared to other vocations, but this includes stamina trained while using skills, climbing enemies, and even running. That's why I like running high stamina builds with Warrior, such as 11-200 Assassin. You can use proficiency to help mitigate the stamina drain on skills, and even athleticism if the running penalty bothers you too much. You can also just unequip the sword when traversing long distances, so I wouldn't waste an augment slot over it. The final downside to Ericles is that you take 50% more damage. Thankfully, there is a skill you can unlock called Don't Get Hit that entirely removes this debuff. Seeing as how Ericles only does good damage around 25% of the time, we need to change our playstyle and skills to those that hit most frequently. That's where Calamitous Lunge and Jump Heavy Attack come into play. Calamitous Lunge is the final version of Indomitable Lunge, and can be acquired from the Warrior's Ring I mentioned earlier. If RNG is on your side, you'll be able to roll a ring that gives both Arc of Obliteration and Calamitous Lunge. If you get this ring, you have basically beaten the game already. Lunge and Jump Heavy Attack hit multiple times, and will become your primary source of DPS. Do note that these attacks do leave you vulnerable, so focus on knocking down an enemy first. You'll also get that nice knockdown damage bonus, so you'll be melting off health bars at insane speeds. Now, Arc of Obliteration has inherently high knockdown and stagger, so you can still use it to make up for the low stagger and knockdown value of Ericles. The Persecutor's Mask, Cursed King's Belt, and Barbed Nails can also make up for this, along with the Impact Augment. That'll be all from this guide. Like Fighter, Warrior requires a rather in-depth understanding of enemies and game mechanics to use at its full potential. For a new player, this vocation may seem outright unplayable, but I hope that this video helps minimize this struggle for as many people as possible. My final piece of advice is this. Hit the enemy with your big weapon, don't get hit by their big weapon. Goodbye, good luck, and stay bonking. I would like to thank the Dragon's Dogma fandom wiki for providing lots of valuable info that made this guide possible. I'd also like to thank my patrons for supporting the channel. Here are the names of all those sexy beasts. Thank you.